Thank you all so much for your faithful support of this ministry. We could not do it without you. God has been so good. I think the last time my wife and I were here in 2017, as if, uh, if I'm correct, and uh, we were supposed to be here in 2020, but we had to get canceled because of COVID. But in 2020, we were able to do something amazing that we never thought possible. Uh, in 2020, we were able to print 1.8 million copies of the Word of God. Uh, that's not a record, but that's pretty close in one of the worst years in American history. You know, I mean, we even had to shut down for several weeks because we had a web pressman get COVID. Uh, he actually was out for 10 weeks due to his sickness. But God uh, blessed. Uh, we were able to hire not one, but two during that time frame. Web pressmen were so we ran two shifts to catch up for the weeks that we were down. So God allowed us to print 1.8 million copies of the Word of God. Going into 21, we just kind of wondered, what in the world could you do after that? So my wonderful wife and dad and me got together and we come up. Who likes a pun? I like a good pun. And I hope y'all catch this one because we couldn't figure out what to do except let's just press on. <laughs> All right, some of y'all got it. So that was the theme of going into 21 and God and showed up and showed off. We were able to print just shy of 2.5 million copies of the Word of God. You know, go ahead, give God the glory. Man, I, I stand amazed every day of my life working in this ministry, just seeing the hand of God upon it and the blessings of God upon it. In March of 21, my dad calls me. I was on the road. I'm normally on the road. And my dad calls me. He says, son, you think God would be pleased if we just order all the paper that we need to print the Word of God. And I told him, I said, Dad, all my life, you and Grandpa's always tried to teach me that there's a fine line between faith and stupidity. <laughs> I said, if we do this, which one are we riding on? <laughs> and uh, so we talked about it a few minutes. I pick up the phone, call our paper salesman. I said, put us on three trailer loads of paper and keep it coming until I call you and tell you to stop. That's three trailer loads a month. And 21 of March, when we did that, it was running somewhere around $800 a roll. Now paper is right at $1,000 a roll. So it was kind of a whole lot easier looking back at it. I say, I oh, praise the Lord. I'm glad we did that. But here, I want to tell you something how God works that a lot of people miss. Because, because we did that, we have not had to miss paper all year. We had them on a standard production. And because we weren't sitting here, send us one, send us two, send us three, uh, because we put them on a standard production of three trailer loads. They've just, like clockwork every month, they send us three trailer loads of paper. And while I know there's a lot of other places that are saying we're having paper shortages, we've had a few glitches with cover stock because we don't ever have that on a standard. We just order it when we need it. But because of God moving and Dad's life on, on March of 2021 saying, you think God would be pleased? And I called him and said, send me three a month. Keep it coming. We have not missed one month where we were not able to print the Word of God. God's been good. So this year we've got this wonderful theme of, and I like it, Rescue the Perishing. Because this is what we Christians should be all about, is rescuing the perishing, care for the dying. Fanny Crosby wrote an amazing song that has to do with that. So how many of you, I just want to kind of real quickly, I don't want to get into a lot of detail because I want to give you a better uh, update uh, in the main service. But how many of you realize what's going on over there in Ukraine? Are we at war? Have you ever realized when we're at war, there's turmoil? 
Where there's turmoil, there's always people looking for hope. And how many of you realize that book in your lap is the only book that is going to give the hope that they're looking for? So again, I think there's something about March in, uh, in this ministry. Uh, I need to be careful next year. I'm going to be prepared, a little more prepared for March to come around. My dad calls me and he says, son, there's war going on in Ukraine and I think we ought to print them a million scriptures. I went, do what? <laughs> he says, I know we've got a lot of obligations, but let's squeeze in a million scriptures for Ukraine. I said, if you're for it, I'm for it too. So we started printing the first 125,000 Ukrainian New Testaments, just I think it was in April. Then we followed it immediately by another 125,000. We just, uh, we just got the third 125,000 off. And the first two containers have been sent going into Poland, going right into Ukraine. And they both will be there. One will be there July the 4th and the other one will be there July the 7th. And the word of God says, the entrance of thy word giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. If we can just get them the word of God, people will come to the saving knowledge of Christ. This is in the Ukrainian language for the Ukrainian people so they can know the God that we know. So my heart breaks for them. I know that they need uh, guns, they need ammo, but uh, praise the Lord, we're able to. Uh, if y'all knew Grandpa and y'all knew him well, he called the Bible and Literature Missionary Foundation the Gospel Munitions Factory. So that's what we're doing over there in Ukraine, sending them munitions, gospels. Amen. So thank you all again for your faithful support and what you all do for this ministry. I promise you we could not do it. We have an amazing scripture conference coming up in October 17th through the 19th. I do would love to invite you to come see it uh, because God's doing some great things. We've uh, got... Uh, Real quickly, I'll share this with you and I'll get into the lesson. Uh, 2020, my, grandfather, my dad had a heart attack. And he goes into the hospital and it's one of those bypass surgeries where they have to actually pull his heart out, stop it beating while they repaired it. He, re he messed up and read the instructions and he says, I just think it'd be easier for me to die than for me to continue on. And you know, I mean, uh, that was, uh, you know, reading what they were going to do, I said, I can understand that. But I said, Dad, I love you and I'm not ready for you to go. And uh, so he had this surgery and uh, it was right before everything shut down. I remember I was in Maryland doing some meetings, being a part of a big meeting there. And uh, we started hearing the rumors of COVID getting bad in Tennessee and Amer uh, America also. And all of a sudden I get home and several of the pastors we were with, uh, we were diagnosed with COVID, but uh, Lord blessed and we weren't. Uh, but God, God did something that was amazing that he got out of the hospital right when everything shut down. And if you know dad, dad's not one of those people that sits still. He can't do it. I mean, he, he's going to make, he, he's be 79 this year, and he makes most 20, 30-year-olds look bad by their work ethic because dad just says, hey, it's got to be done. Let's get it done. You know, he don't sit there and try to figure out how the easiest way he says it's got to be done. Let's do it. So I always said that the Lord shut down the world just for Bobby Lamont to get a couple of weeks of rest. <laughs> <laughs> and that may have been the true case. But after that, we were having a meeting and dad called me into his office. He says, Shannon, what would you need if God calls me home to continue this ministry? I looked at him, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about it, but this is kind of the in the way of introduction to this lesson. I told him, I said, Dad, you've forgotten more about printing than I will ever know. I said, Dad, I don't know if there's anybody in this world that can replace you. 
But I said, I do know that if there's any presses that are fixing to need to be replaced, I need you to fix that problem because I wouldn't know what to get. So Dan says, I've been thinking about that. And he says, I think that our web press has got somewhere around four to five more years. He says, uh, so I'll start thinking and praying about what God would have us do in that. And uh, so it didn't no more get out of this conversation. I'm going to say it was less than a month in between this conversation. He gets a phone call from a guy. He says, Bobby, I've got the web press you need. He said, what is it? He says, it's a Harris M1000 that allow you to go from a 48-page signature to a 64-page signature. It'll allow you to print double sheets. He says, it'll just help you increase productivity and you can do it faster and more affordable. Dad says, all right, let me see if I can get with my son. We'll fly out and go look at it. He called me and I mean, I was booked. I said, dad, there's no way I can go see this in the next three or four weeks. He says, all right. He calls him after about a week. He says, if you think you know we need it, send it to us. Then he says, I forgot to ask, how much is it? He says, $75,000. You got to understand, you don't pick up a web press for $75,000. You pick up web press for hundreds of thousands of dollars. So dad says, all right, I'll get you a check. He went to the bank, uh, borrowed, I think, a, uh, to, f from our equity and just said, Lord, for some reason, you, I know you want us to have this press. Let's see what you're going to do with it. Four weeks from that time, me and dad were scheduled to be in a church together in Mississippi. Me and dad do not travel together. Dad's doing less travel than ever. But he wanted to go to uh, the pastor, called him personally. He says, I want you here and I want you to bring your son. So he calls me. We had this meeting on the books for probably seven or eight months. And while I was up there, I was talking about how God opened up the door for us to get another web press. I said, but the amazing thing about it is, is God gave it to us for a steal of $75,000. I got, I got done talking and the pastor gets up there and he says, well, that's one reason I wanted y'all to come today. We had raised $72,000 to give y'all. <laughs> then he says, but I don't want anybody else to have any on this press. Uh, who wants to give $3,000, you know, to this before we left? You know, they gave us another 3000 to make it seventy-five, dollars buying that web press. And here's what I wanted to tell you right here is because I thought we were going to replace the web press we had. My faith must have been like this, brother. Dad says, no, we're going to run both of them until we can't run the other one anymore. So we're building it right beside our other web press where we're going to be running two web presses. So we're hoping, we told them that it says uh, you, they got to, it's got to be running by October. So uh, Lord willing, we're going to be running both presses during our scripture conference. And it's going to be something to see. I am looking forward to what God's going to do in this ministry. And that is mainly because of this church helping us buy rolls of paper so we can print the word of God and give it to missionaries free of charge. Thank you so much. God uh, laid this on my heart. How many of you have ever heard of great stories of old missionaries of days past? Man, I love listening to them. I love listening to how God did great things in their ministry. I love listening to how God used them and the power of God behind them. And they, they saw thousands of people saved or they saw great multitudes of money brought in for ministries. And I mean, I hear these stories all the time. And I'm sitting there looking at my wife reading this biography of William Tyndale. Uh, William Tyndale is a different story, but if you know anything about William Tyndale, William Tyndale was a, a, a Christian. He was a saved man, I believe it wholeheartedly. Because his friends even say about Tyndale, says if there wasn't ever a Christian, there, William Tyndale was that man. Just because his love and his passion for the word of God. 
William Tyndale was in a, a lunch table. He was eating dinner over some dignitaries before he started translating the word of God. He was staying at a friend's house for, for a while there. And his friend was a dignitary. And they said that he had probably had Henry VIII and, you know, probably Catherine of Argonne and, you know, or Anna Boland sit at his dinner table and eat dinner with William Tyndale there. I love these stories because a lot of the history does not portray that kind of history of William Tyndale. But William Tyndale was in a little debate over this dinner table with a, a priest there. That This priest made the statement that he says it is better to be without God's law than without the Pope's. If you're red-blooded and you're a Christian, that would bother you. So it bothered William Tyndale. He stands up in that dinner table and he says, excuse me, sir, but I defy you. I defy the Pope. And if God spare my life, I will cause the plowboy to know more about the word of God than thyself. You see this beautiful picture where if you know anything about the history of the Bible, William Tyndale was used of God to bring us the first translation of the TR in the Hebrew Masoretic in the English language. That wasn't in my notes, but that was free. Because I love great men used by a great God to do great things. And I'm sitting here going, I say, why are we not seeing that today? Why are we not hearing of great men and great things being done from a great God? The, he says, I'm the same today, yesterday, and forever. I change not. So I kept going and said, Lord, Lord, I want to be a great man used by a great God. You know, uh, shortly, not too many days ago, a friend of mine sent me a text that says, God uses the man God chooses. I'm sitting there going, wow. Great things are still being done from a great God. We're just, we're just too busy to see the things. You know, one of the reasons why is the the altar here has become a museum of what used to be and not what a, it could be. I remember I've been in church all my life. I tell people that I was drugged to church. I was drugged to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and any other time that the doors were open. My dad, he came to all three of his sons at the age of 18. He says, kids, I can't help you buy a house. I can't afford to help you. But he says, what I can do is tell you that you don't have to move out until you're ready. And he didn't. None, none of his three kids moved out until they were 25. They moved down the time they married their wives. And the reason he said that is because I can keep an eye on you and help you. <laughs> I said, that's pretty smart. I mean, I'm going to do the same thing. We tell Mike in serenity, I say, y'all are never getting married. Y'all are living with us forever. It's a dangerous world out there. <laughs> but you see this beautiful thing. And I brought dad up for that reason is because... I see a great God using a great man every day of my life. Here, I'm fixing to make all, of, I hope y'all lose some sleep over this next statement. Because here's what I see. My, my dad and I are, we're ordering three trailer loads of paper. And we were brought to our attention that we're having an opportunity before a price increase in July that we can order as many trailer loads up to six that we wanted to order. And dad said, put me in for six. So in July, we're going to have six trailer loads of paper come to the shop. We are going to have to have 270,000 almost. Each one of them is going to be around 44, 45,000 dollars. 
So you just kind of let you know how much a trailer load of paper is going to run. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about this passage of scripture that I'm fixing to read in Acts that says, where's the power of God? And I hear things like this and I'm just going, where's the power of God? Wouldn't you agree that sometimes we overlook the obvious and we start worrying about the things that we have no control over? In Acts 17, I want you to see this real quickly. I'll be done in 15 minutes if you listen fast. I didn't plan on talking about the ministry that much, but I love this church. I love what they're doing for the ministry. love what they're doing for the cause of Christ. And in Acts chapter 17, let's just go ahead and skip down all the big heavy words that I can't pronounce anyway. Verse 2, it says, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbaths day reasoned with them out of the Scriptures opening and alleging uh, alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preached unto you is Christ. And some of them believed. I love that. Let's let's cut, cut to grunchy granola. It's still the gospel that changes people's lives. Amen. Can you imagine what it was like in Paul and Silas's day when they just opened up the Bible and they said that Christ must have needed to suffer and risen again? I like how Paul always uses the, the whole gospel. In verse 4, you see, and some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and a, of the chief women, not a few. This is just one of the few reasons that I love ladies' conferences. Uh, Thank you for inviting my wife because women have some control over the home. A lot of ladies don't believe that, but they have a lot of control over the home. Happy wife, happy life. But the Jews, which believe not, moved with envy took unto them certain lewd fellows of the basser sort and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. All right, you read that with me? We are to this scene where the people that did not believe Consulted with some people that were very wicked and vile. I've often wondered why people that cannot be happy, they hang out with the wrong crowd. And my principle of 13 years always preached that if you hang out with the wrong crowd, you are the wrong crowd. They brought in these lewd fellers. These were wicked guys. These were heartless. These were ruthless guys. They were willing to do anything to achieve what they wanted. But I want you to see something here that's amazing. Verse 6, it says, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. I've read that passage of scripture a thousand times and I've never really gone, really considered what it was really saying. It's going a little deeper than I want you to understand. I want you to see this real quickly that he's talking about just because I don't believe you, I'm not on the same page as you. You're turning my world upside down. You're preaching to me, Christ crucified and rose again. That just doesn't make sense. I refuse to believe that. But that conviction, that prick in the heart, you remember that the day that you got saved? (laughs) Said, hey, Shannon, uh, you're going to die and go to a sinner's hell if you don't receive me. You know, that turns the world upside down. That does something that changes our lives. 
And every one of us in this room has probably met somebody at some point that has, you've turned the world upside down. Man, I have been traveling for this ministry 15 years. And I love when I give the track to somebody and they receive it. I say, man, I'm going to read that when I get home. Man, that blesses my heart. But have you ever noticed that out of uh, 10 people that you give a track to that receives it, there's always going to be a, that one? I mean, come on. We've all met that one. That when you hand them a track, they go, I'm not interested. I don't know about you, but that used to offend me. <laughs> I have gotten in more trouble. I think Miss Bass is starting to figure out that I, I like sarcasm. She's starting to dish it out a little bit, and I go, wow, this is great stuff. <laughs> I remember the very first time that me and my wife went door knocking after we started traveling. I've been door knocking before, but me and my wife, we started traveling for the ministry, and we went door knocking. I think it was at a friend's a church in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, and I was knocking on that door, and uh, this gentleman opened the door, and I said, hello, my name's Shannon Lamont. I'm, uh, I print Bibles for a living, and I'm just here visiting a friend of mine's church uh, here in Lawrenceburg. I'd like to find out uh, if you died today, where would you go? He said, oh, I'm saved. Man, I like that answer. Man, the way he just shot it out, the way he said it, I said, nice. This is going to be a good visit. <laughs> then I said, sir, do you go to church? With almost the same breath, slam. Me being the nice guy I am, I leaned to knock on the door. My wife says, what are you doing? I said, somebody needs to tell him. <laughs> she knows exactly what I'm talking about when I said somebody needs to tell him. Hey, if you're saved and you know it, you ought to say, man, you said you were saved, so why me taking my time on a, on a Saturday night offends you wanting to invite you to the house of God? The house of God is important. The house of God is where we come to get unified and, and, and get rejuvenated for the things of God. So I said, why would we not want to go to the house of God if we're saved? Man, I had this whole sermon pre ready to preach when he answered the door. I was, I was going to be ready with both barrels. And my wife says, you can't do that. I go, why not? She said, you don't want to offend him. I said, somebody needs to tell him. <laughs> Claims he's saved, but he don't want to hear the things of God. I uh, often think about that when they're talking about when turning the world upside down. I mean, William Carey, he was raised in the Church of England. He was saved and eventually joined the Baptist Church. And he is known as the father of modern missions. He was an English missionary to India. He was a skilled linguist and a writer. He did many things for the cause of Christ. Adoniram Judson, he was the first North American missionary in Myanmar, uh, then Burma. He took 12 years to see his first 18 converts. And I think about these men of great, think about David Livingstone, a missionary with the London Missionary Society. He was born in England, but spent most of his life in Africa as a doctor and an explorer. He literally mapped most of the continent of Africa to prepare the way for future missionaries to come to Africa. Hudson Taylor, he spent more than 50 years in China. He is known for the respect of the Chinese culture. He worked as a doctor, evangelist, and a translator. He personally influenced hundreds to become missionaries in this time, and many missionaries still claim that they are still being influenced by the biographies and autobiographies of Hudson Taylor. Man, I read these stories and say, I want to be like that. I read this story in Acts and said, man, Paul and Silas and these, these men turned their world upside down because they were telling them something that they needed to hear, but they didn't want to hear it. 
I got down and I said, what are the things that made them so great? The Lord showed me in Isaiah chapter 6, you remember that, that there was availability. He said, also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go forth? Then said I, here am I, send me. I was given the opportunity to print some Bibles for a man by the name of Ivan Schoen. Ivan Schoen, he tells me the story of, how many of you know the Through Gates of Splendor story? Where they went over there and they, they speared the five missionaries and the wives went back over there and they won them to Christ. He, he's telling me that he's in a factory there in Texas and all of a sudden he's given a paper that had a picture of several of the missionaries floating in the water with spears and her back. The Lord says to him, he says, would you do that for me? He says, I walked in and I turned in my two week notice. Started praying for God to do something with me and my family. He said, God called us to the Wyana Indians. He says, we get there. We didn't know nothing about them. <coughs> he said, no mission board would accept us. So he says, I'll, uh, I'll go. So they went. And all of a sudden, they find out that they still kill them and eat them there. They find out 10 years later that they took tribal council to kill them and eat them the very day that they arrived. One man in the tribe says, what are they here for? He's not here for our women. He's here. But he's got one. He's not here for our kids. He's got two. So, well, what are they here for? So they took uh, counsel, they voted uh, to find out before they killed them and eat them. And almost 50 years to the date, we gave them the word of God in their own language. There's so many more stories that I can share with you about them, but I wanted you to see what made these men so incredible was their availability. Number two, I want you to see their tenacity, their determination. So likewise, Luke 14, says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciples. For years, I've been a pen pal to a missionary to Mexico by the name of Bob Hawk. He was introduced to me early in uh, my school life. I had to write a letter to a missionary and I picked him and I've stayed somewhat in contact with him through the years, checking in on him. But this missionary alone has been poisoned several times. His wife has been kidnapped. His daughter has been kidnapped, but he keeps on going for the Lord. Why? Because he says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You see that what made these men incredible for the Lord was their availability, their tenacity, and I like this one, the fervency. This is their passion and their burden. Romans 10, 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And they had a desire to do something great for God. George Lau may not be a name that you recognize. Some of you may have. But 10 years before William Carey ever left to go to England to go to the foreign mission field, George Lyle left for Jamaica after his owner freed him from slavery to follow God's call on his life. Lau was saved at the age of 23 after his owner, a Baptist deacon, freed him from slavery. He preached for two years in the slave plantations around Savannah and South Carolina, leading many to Christ. Because of his faithful and his powerful preaching of the word, many surrendered their lives to Christ. After his ordination, he planted the first American Baptist church in North America that is still in existence today. In 1778, Henry Sharp was killed in the Revolutionary War. After his death, Sharp's heirs took steps to re-enslave Lyle. As a result of their action, Lyle was thrown back into prison. Eventually, he was able to produce his proper documentation concerning his freedom and was freed again. Soon after his release, Moses Kirkland, a col colonial on the a colonel in the British Army befriended Lau and helped him leave the country. Kirkland helped pray, pay for Lau's trip to Jamaica, and after two years, Lau paid the debt and obtained a certificate of his freedom again for himself and for his family. 
George and his wife Hannah and their four children left Savannah and landed in Kingston, Jamaica in 1782. When Lyle landed in Jamaica, it was a British colony there that Lyle founded a land and a people who needed a missionary. Slaves were brought from Africa to Jamaica to work in the sugar plantations, and these men and women had no real knowledge of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Lyle planted a church and helped the baptism service every three months, and these baptisms were public events in which professing converts were baptized in a nearby ocean or river. The work of the church and the public baptism caused persecution. Eventually, Lau was charged with preaching sedition and was thrown back into prison. He was later acquitted of these charges despite facing these hostilities. During the eight years of preaching, he was able to baptize 500 people and establish a strong church. Not only did Lyle's ministry lead to a spiritual impact on the island, but his work also made a social difference for the Jamaican slaves. By July 31, 1838, slavery was eradicated in Jamaica. In 1814, there were only about 8,000 Baptists in Jamaica. This number included slaves, freedmen, and some whites. However, as a result of Lyle's ministry, by 1832, there were over 20 thousand professed believers in Jamaica. That's why I say I want to be one of those that turn the world upside down. Would you like to be one of those that turn the world upside down? Because right here in Acts chapter 17, Paul and Silas is just telling them something that they needed to know. And that's what people like Hudson Taylor Adoniram Judson, David Livingstone, and George Lyle. They saw a need and they said, hey, these people need to know the truth of the gospel. You know, I'm done. I just want to conclude with this illustration and I'm done. My grandfather, you most of y'all probably know that he was in World War II and he was hit by a mortar and he goes down and he's, due to the severity of his wounds, they probably didn't think he was going to make it. But after three months in the hospital, he spent there and he uh, recovered and made him a chaplain's assistant in the United States Army. And as a result of that mortar going off right beside him, guess what? God showed him that nobody had a copy of the Word of God. He was able to travel around war turn Europe, Germany, and France, and nobody had a copy of the Word of God. He wrote back to his family and friends, said, please send me Bibles. He said that it was a most amazing thing when he would get some Bibles. He would take it into a church. He would go to the pastor and say, Pastor, I have some Bibles. Can I give them to some people? And the pastor said, without fail, please give them to our elderly first. He says that it changed his life when he would go into a church and he would give somebody a Bible at probably somewhere around 60, 70 years of age. They would look at that Bible and they would fan through it and they would just grab it like this and they would start weeping. I said, I never thought I'd see one of these. You know the rest of the story of how the ministry was started. Grandpa and Dad, 1968, got together and says, you think God would be pleased if we started printing the Word of God? And Dad said, yes, I believe he's already dealing with me. So they started printing the Word of God. You know, I've often wondered every time I read that passage in Acts chapter 17, you know, uh, Paul and Silas is the lead characters in that passage. It says, you know, he talks about Jason and the other people that were with him. These are those that turned the world upside down. But I've often wondered what this world would have been like if a Bob Lamon and a Bobby Lamon would have never started a Bible printing ministry. Over 65 million Bibles would have never been produced. There's a whole lot more that I can share with it. Several other ministries would have never got started either. But these are those that turn the world upside down. I want to do something great for God. I want to turn somebody's world upside down. I'm sorry if it offends you, but this is the truth. Jesus died for you. Amen. And he rose again. You know how I know that? 
because of the word of God. So let's turn somebody's world upside down. Let's be classified in somebody as great. Because if you lead somebody to Christ, I promise you they will look at you and say, thank you for telling me the truth. But there's always going to be that one that says, I'm not interested. But you know something I learned is God's not looking for somebody that can. God's looking for somebody that will. You know, I've read the Bible between Genesis and Revelation. Y'all can correct me if I'm wrong. But I have not found anywhere in the Bible that tells me that I have to win them. I know my life verse is Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. But it tells us to go. It tells us to tell them. So you know what that tells me? The monkey's not on our back. The monkey's on Jesus Christ's back. He just wants us to tell them. Turn their world upside down so we can do great things for God. And God will produce the fruit. Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us. Lord, we need you so desperately. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our complacency of where we've not told somebody about Jesus Christ. When that nudge is in our heart to say, hey, open your mouth, tell them about me, and we walk away because we're scared. Lord, give us a boldness, give us a, a tenacity, give us a fervency, give us availability. Help us to turn the world upside down for you. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.